الكتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال ربكم ودعوني أستجب لكم إن الذين يستكبرون عن عبادتي سيدخلون جهنم داخرين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful, and all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this existence and considering us worthy to represent him on this earth. And of course, he doesn't need representation. But the fact that we share in his infinite bounty and grace by existing and becoming the tongue, the eyes, the movement for goodness for God is, I think, is a great honor. And the fact that while God is not in need of anything, when he continues to create and give his mercy upon his creations, nothing is greater than when that created being gets closer to the source of their existence and to therefore reap greater beneficence and mercy than to be in the proximity of God. And that is why when we pray, we, you know, when we start any good act, we say qurbatan ilallah. In order to get closer to God, here what it means is to receive greater benefits. And Allah in the Quran has blessed us with numerous kinds of guidances, as we know in this blessed month. And in this month, it is a month of fasting where we train ourselves to be controlled and, and contained and to be visionary and guided so that we reach higher stations. And Allah has commanded us to abstain from indulging in certain pleasures, such as drinking and eating, for a short period of time, in order to train us to become better in how we should guide ourselves. And tonight I want to specifically touch on the power of prayer, the power of dua, because this is a huge subject. This requires actually a very long period of conversation because you'll find everything that we do is within the parameter of prayer. But as a foundation, I want us to understand what is prayer. Allah in Surah Balad, Allah said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Indeed, we have created mankind in a state of trepidation meaning you will be in stress. And here the, use, the word is used called kabad. Kabad is the same word that is used for liver. <clears throat> and liver is an organ in our body that is one of the most stressed organs in our body, the liver. It is the one that has the, you think it's the heart that is most stressed. No, it's the liver. And Allah's mercy is such that because it is such a stressed organ, it is an organ that can regenerate itself even though much of it is damaged. So if a liver is damaged, it has the capacity to regenerate itself. But Allah uses that same term for us, kabad. You are in a state of trepidation. And I want us to know what that means. God is merciful. And He doesn't like us when we fail. He doesn't like us to go through pain and difficulty. Allah is merciful. Just like a mother doesn't want it, their child or the father doesn't want the child or the family to you know, go through pain and suffering. None of us like it. Actually, we, we feel, we sometimes empathize, not only sympathize, but we empathize the pain of others. And we don't like it when other people go through pain. We, we wish we could remove it. And we as a created entity, we as a created being have such emotions we ask the question then why is it that God allows people to go through pain and trials and tribulation and it's a great question but on a grander scheme of things we find that such pain is not bad given its qualities and even if that pain leads to death you will find that the Almighty controls our destiny with eternal factors, meaning our existence is eternal. And Allah can remove that pain from us. In fact, scientists know that the pain and the nerves that we have 
on the tips of our fingers and the rest of our body has been placed there precisely to keep us protected and for us to know what is good and what is bad. In fact, it's very dangerous when you and I numb our sensors of pain because you could put your hand on fire and your whole hand can burn and you won't know it. And that's dangerous. So Allah has created pain as a means of us to know what the limits are. So pain is good if it's understood on what its capacities are and what should be done and how it should be used. But unfortunately there are beings who are wicked and vicious who torture people using pain. And Allah will punish them. Allah says, لا يحزنك كفرهم You know, these people I have allowed them, but don't. Their rejection of me, I have allowed them. إلينا مرجعهم فننبعهم مما عملوا إن الله عليم بذات الصدور Allah says, نمتعهم قليلا ثم نترهم إلى عذاب غليظ We let them do it. Then we will grab them and punish them. But be patient. But we as the good people on earth should work hard to prevent evildoers from torturing people. We should prevent them from hurting people. We should do that. Many an evil society and people indulge in such punishments on others because we are acquiescent, we are silent. We don't raise our voices against tyranny, which then leads to this kind of you know, blasphemy and pain. But Allah says, we made you this way. That's one thing I want you to remember. We've been made weak in a state of trepidation. Yet our spirit, our souls, to reject evil has been made very strong. Meaning, while people can put guns in front of us, bombs in front of us, yet we can be firm in our faith to not allow anything to be sold for any kind of pain. Allah says in Quran, Rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'an an dhikrillah wa iqam salati wa ita'i zakati yakhafun yawman tatakallabu fihi al qulub wal absar. Mankind that refuses to bargain for any price on the matters of truth, on the matters of worship of God. For the remembrance of God. They maintain their prayer. They give charity. And they are afraid of that day when God will hold them accountable for all the grace that God has given us. So, we are weak in one state, but very strong on the other side. But that weakness can be strengthened with iman, with faith, with vision, with long-term uh, understanding, and with dua, with prayer. So you find first and foremost in the system of Allah, you will see that the universe within its mechanics allows probability the principle of probability, which in simplistic terms we call chance. Something can happen. It's like a flip of a coin. You flip a coin, it's 50-50. It could be heads or tails. It's called chance. In mathematics, we call it probability. What is the probability, you see, that the coin will land on a head or a tail? They say if you do it with as many permutations as possible, it's 50-50 if you keep the coin balanced. So what happens is it's called, it's called probability. Within the system of probability, it's very fascinating. It's a deep subject. I won't go deep into this today. But it's, I just want to let you know, if you ever want to get into it, it's an amazing area, probability. The principles of chance. You find even atheism tries to hang on to probability as an argument for the non-existence of God. It's interesting. You find people who want to reject Allah will use probability as a sign that maybe God didn't make us. Maybe it came with another reason. They use probability. But quickly as a summary, pure prob probability for anything to exist is impossible. And for the universe to come into existence out of pure probability is zero. It's impossible. It's ridiculous. Probability is only a subset of existence. 
meaning when things come into existence with structure and order and form and design and time and space and matter, within it is the principle of probability, meaning chance and accidents can only happen within a structured system. You cannot have it the other way around. You cannot have pure chance causing existence. It's absurd. This idea is nonsense. It's not science. It's not mathematics. I'm simply saying it. Anybody who's in mathematics here can gladly discuss with me. Anybody who claims that, you know, pure chance is the cause of all is, is not science. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. You find probability is within a created system where something can happen. Like, for example, you get in the car and the physics are of collisions, for example. You have roads, you have roads that crisscross, you know, T-junctions, you have cross junctions, traffic lights, right? You have cars going in your direction, you have cars going against you, you've got cars going in different directions, 360. Probability states that when you're driving a car, that probability allows an object to hit you at any time. It's possible. That's called probability. Somebody could lose their senses on the other side of the road and their car can come towards you and the law of physics dictates that you couldn't escape the collision and the car hit you and you could have died or become paralyzed or whatever. We call it an accident. It's all built on the principles of probability. And people try to control probability by sometimes planting accidents, using the game of probability. It's a fascinating subject, but I want to introduce it as to the basis of dua. We ask, why dua? Why do you have to pray? Because Allah has put the principles of chance within His creation to test us. And has given us the power to minimize the probability of evil. And has put in intelligence in us to minimize the probability of destruction. So you look at the cars today, they are much safer than they were yesterday. Because we've, through trials and errors, we've figured out ways to make roads safer, ways to make cars safer, ways to make our aircraft safer. And you notice a lot less accidents take place in the air than they used to. Millions of people today get on the plane and the probability of an accident is always there, always there, but it's much less. And another accident takes place, you'll find the FAA and all the aeronautical engineers will go and study through the black box what caused this accident so that we can minimize it the next time. This principle is in deen too. In my taqwa, the same thing. When Allah says, Ittaqillah, be God conscious, God is saying, when you make a sin, you make a mistake, you say something dumb and stupid, and it comes to hurt you tomorrow, learn to improve it by reducing that probability. So the principle of probability is very powerful. And within it, there's always a chance, no matter who you are, that a stray bullet, or something from the sky will fall and hurt you and kill you, a lightning bolt. Anything is possible. And people wonder like, oh my God, is there safety? If I leave my house, will I come home safe? You don't know. You minimize it by taking safety measures physically, but the quintessential level of safety where there is sukoon is in dua. So in this ayah, in Surah Al-Ghafir, as you know, Surah Ghafir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ دَعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord says, Call upon me, I will answer you. Surely those who are too proud for my service, means those who are too proud to pray to me, they will be punished. So Allah is saying, my system is, know your value and know that you are a weak creation. Mankind has been made weak. Da'ifan. Insan is da'if. Wallahu ghani. Wa antumul fuqara. 
God is all wealthy. You are poor. Know that. Now you hold on to the rope of Allah and say, my source of my destiny, my provider of my food and my stability and my security and my eternity is God. God says, now that prayer becomes alive because now you understand who you are. So Allah in this ayah is unconditional. Ad'uni astajib lakum. Ask me, I will reply you. I want us to know what is this prayer. It's very deep. Now, there are a couple of layers of dua. I'm going to touch on many, given the time that I have within the 20 minutes. But I'll try my best to do justice to this subject. First and foremost is salah. When we pray, when Allah tells us to pray, aqim as salah, maintain prayer. And Quran is constant about this. You know, they maintain prayer. Even the verse I just told you, rijalun. لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة. They keep prayer. They give charity. In every verse, Allah reveres the believers that the ones who keep prayer, keep prayer, keep prayer. Now, why do we need to pray? People say Allah doesn't need my prayer. Why should I pray? Knowing this principle of probability, I want you to understand why. But take it higher than probability. Let's not even go to probability. Let's take it higher one step. Salah is a, uh, is a practice for gratitude, for thanks. So a young boy once came and asked me, and many times I'm asked that question, Brother, why should I pray? I don't have the spirit to pray. I feel like I'm a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. I don't feel like I'm doing anything. I'm just thinking about 10 things while I'm praying. I said, it's okay. Are you praying? He said, yes. But, you know, I'm not getting that khushu. I don't get that connection. I said, you won't get the connection if you haven't plugged in to the system of God. If prayer becomes a distraction to you, whereby you are busy trying to achieve worldly gains, and adhan is recited, it's a distraction to you. Hence, out of courtesy, you will pray because you know you have to, but it's a courtesy where you will sort of be distracted from your worldly pursuits to pray to God. That's why you don't get connected. It's like you're busy talking to somebody, you're very engaged, you're very deep in that conversation you're real there's a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation and somebody comes and taps on your shoulder and you look at them out of courtesy and then after looking at them out of courtesy you give them a few seconds of attention but your heart and mind is there but you're giving courtesy to this one who's just intr uh, intruded to many of us, Salah is that person tapping on my shoulder. Like, yeah, what? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh. oh your mind is there, but you are giving lip service to this one. This is why our Salah often has no connection. It's a, let me get it done with, so I can feel good. Because I know if God, you know, if I pray, then, you know, I won't be thrown in hell. Many a times you ask children and adults, why do you pray? Oh, I don't want to go to hell. Like God is so much in need of our prayers that if you don't pray to him, he's going to throw you in hell. Like he's going to get so disappointed that you ignored him. That's not true. Not at all. Now, if you avoid praying and you reject Allah's mercy, of course you deserve to be punished. But that's not the reason why we pray. We pray because we appreciate his grace. So I give this example. If somebody comes to your door and gives you a wonderful gift, something you really like, and you open the door, what do you do? Do you welcome the person? Do you engage with them? Do you talk to them? Do you give them attention? Because they have given you, they have a gift in front of their hands, and they're handing it to you. You have total attention to that person. And then what do you do? What is the protocol? Ask any human being on earth, seven and a half billion people who are intelligent, ask them, when a gift is given to you, what do you do? Say, I thank them. Do you wait 10 minutes to thank them? Do you wait half an hour to thank them? 
Do you wait a day to thank them? You know how insulting it is to wait? The longer you wait, the less you give the gift and the gifter. Isn't it amazing? Logic, rationality. When you and I understand the grace of Allah, then salah becomes natural. I'm not going to pray because he's going to throw me in hell. No, I'm in love with this being. I am so in love that I'm waiting for the beloved to call me. It's like when you hold a phone, you know, and you, you just got engaged. You can't wait for that fiancé of yours to call you, you know, because you're so in love. And if they are delayed even five minutes, you get, you get uncomfortable. And when the phone rings, you don't wait for it to ring twice. You pick it up. Yes, hello, yes, huh? I'm here. Now imagine somebody sends a gift to you. Do you wait? Say, oh, gift. Let me open it. Ah, oh, it's nice. Very beautiful. And the gifter is standing there. And sometimes sadly, okay, bye. Close the door. <laughs> like, no thanks. What should you do? Protocol. Consciousness. Immediately say, oh, wow. You didn't have to. That's so wonderful. You remembered me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm so grateful. I want to give you a hug. I love you. We do that. It's protocol. You don't have to be Muslim to do that. You have to be human to do that. Islam touches humanity at its highest level. And Allah says, look at what I'm doing for you every second. You might say, but why five times a day, God? Can I say it once? We say that. You know, it's funny. Sometimes, you know, you do something for somebody, they'll send you a message, brother, I, I can't thank you enough. An hour later, brother, I just want to let you know, I just can't thank you. Okay, you told me an hour ago. Yeah, but brother, I just, it's, not, it's just not leaving my mind, you know. I just want to thank you again. Is it bad? No. So Allah is saying to me, if I gave you to pray once a day, maybe you'd complain to me that God, you give me so much, you only talk, you allow me to talk to you once? Why not five times a day? Isn't it beautiful? And Allah says, I'm so merciful, I make it three times a day. Why? So that you know the purpose of life. And I come in between all your worldly pleasures so that I remind you that while you are achieving all these pleasures of this world, don't forget, I am the giver. So salah is built on gratitude. How am I gratitude? How am I a grateful person? How do I practice gratitude? Look around you. Every handshake. Every smile. When raindrops, you know when Hugh Downs was doing 2020, there was a man waiting for a heart transplant because his heart was failing. And the last minute, this wealthy man, he was a wealthy man, last minute, he gets a heart. And he survived. And 2020 did a whole long-term, you know, uh, show on him. And finally, when this man has recovered, gotten his heart, he's back alive, you Downs ask him, what's the first thing you're going to do now that you have a heart? He says, I'm going to go outside this hospital when it rains and I'm going to wait for the rain to fall on my face. What? People think you're crazy. Ask a child, come on, let's go outside, let's feel the rain. What's wrong with you? Give me my tools, my toys, you know, my expensive games. I want cars and I want fancy things. This rich man says, I want to go feel the rain fall on my face. Allah says, Qalilan ma tashkurun. How little you are grateful. Like that individual who's claiming that my friends are so rich. They're so rich. How come I'm not rich? Some of us are depressed because everyone around us seems to be richer, nicer looking, better clothes, better lifestyle than ours. We've got it wrong. We've got it wrong. The messenger, Ahl al-Bayt, have told us, never compare yourself with somebody who when it comes to your material pleasures, never compare yourself with those who are wealthier than you. Compare yourself with those who are less than you so you'll always be happy. But aspire for higher existence. But don't be depressed because others are more than you. So this story of an angel comes to a man and says, really, you're complaining you're poor? He said, yeah, I am poor. 
He said, if Allah gave you all a billion dollars, I'm just using a, an analogy here. Hmm? Ten billion dollars. And you lost one eye. And it's going to cost you a billion dollars to get it back. Will you, will you give it? And the man said, without a doubt. Without batting an eye, I will give it. He says, then you lost your other eye. That's another billion. Then you lost your finger. You lost your legs. And by the time he finished his conversation in a few minutes, he exhausted his $10 billion, to use the analogy. He said, you foolish man, what are you complaining about your poverty when you are so rich and how blessed you are as a human being? Have you looked in the mirror how blessed you are with your mobility and ability and agility? Have you looked at that? Subhanallah. This is why our prayers are weak. When we make dua, do it through grace. Look around you and see the possibility of probabilities that I could lose it all and all of this could go away. I could be debilitated. I could be paraplegic, if not quadriplegic. And then I won't be able to get something. I remember in my university, there was a quadriplegic boy on my floor and he used to call me the other room. He says, Hassanain, can you help me? I said, sure. And he's quadriplegic. He says, can you get me that? Can you put that in my mouth? I said, sure. I take it and I put it in his mouth. And something in my head tells me, what about you? How blessed are you? This boy was able to run and walk, but he took a dive in a shallow lake and he hit his head on a rock. And today, he's a quadriplegic. He cannot even lift that. He's looking at it and there's nothing he can do. Alhamdulillah, today we have prosthetics and technologies which allows us to even use robots to get something for us, which is a rahm of Allah anyway, but nothing beats Mobility and independence, ability to decide and to move with agility. How little we are grateful, brothers and sisters. Honestly, when someone asks me, why should I pray? I say, go look in the mirror for God's sakes and see what Allah has given you. And stop asking this question the way you might think it's a burden, but consider it a grace that God has enabled you to come to him and ask him and to pray to him, and, and to talk to him, and to console you, for there is nothing better in the world than prayer. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. You find the power of prayer? Imagine somebody is a billionaire, they're sick in the hospital. You'll find nothing is more powerful than when you say to them, I pray for you. You go to the wealthiest people in the world, Malcolm Forbes, when he was dying on his deathbed. You know, Forbes was a very wealthy man, a billionaire. And he's sick, dying. You think he'll tell the doctor, I'll give you a million dollars more? Hear me? Even Walt Disney, who was a billionaire also, could do nothing but freeze his body through cryogenics with the hope that in the future they will find a cure for his life, for his, you know, for his health problem, because he loves his existence. Why shouldn't he? It's a blessing, it's a grace of God. But you go to such people and say, you're rich, give a few million. The hospitals will come in your direction, we'll help you. They said, no money will help me. Hmm? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alladhi huwa yut'imuni wa yaskin, wa idha maridhtu fa huwa yashfeen. He is the one who quenches your thirst, gives you your rizq, and makes your thirst quenched. And when you are sick, he cures you. Prayer, it's powerful. Studies have been done that people who pray cure miraculously. People who are prayed for cure miraculously. And they don't even know they're being prayed for. You know that? Research shows that even if you don't know someone is praying for you, you will find that. You get better cure, you cure faster than those who don't get prayed for. Quran mentions in many verses, in many chapters and verses where angels are praying for us when we do good. Now you ask, why are angels praying for us? Allah says, it's my rahmah. It's a means to connect that this game of probability that is on your, in, in your life, when you seek it and you ask me to intervene, I intervene. The Holy Prophet has stated when you leave your house, recite ikhlas seven times. Seven times, Allah will bring you back the way you left. Imam Ali was asked, How do I avoid such accidents? He said, Give charity. Charity. 
Give charity to the needy. Give charity to the poor. Keep giving because you have trust in God. God will protect you. Give it and do istighfar. Seek grace. Allah says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Hasten to protection and forgiveness where a parent towards your Lord, where a paradise awaits you greater than the earth and sky put together. أُعِدَّتْ It's a calling to those who are God-conscious. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالدَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاذِمِينَ الْغَيْضِ they give charity in good times and in bad times. And they hold their anger. They swallow their anger. And they forgive mankind. This is the prescription of the Quran. You won't find such sublime verses in any book on earth. In terms of its intensity and quality, second to none. Muhsineen. Forgive mankind. God loves the good doers. Tonight is the night of dua. Tomorrow, as you know, we will discuss the shahada of Khadijat al Kubra, the beloved wife of the Holy Prophet Khadija bint Khawailid. And I will talk about womanhood tomorrow. But tonight, I want us to reflect in this month of Ramadan, the month of dua. Now, we may ask when we pray, why is it that our prayers don't get accepted? in totality. There is a book I recommend every one of you to read. It's called Hidden uh, Truths uh, in the Quran by Sayyid Marhum Sayyid Mujtaba Musa Vilari. I met this august man in my life when I was in the Islamic Republic. Sayyid Mujtaba Musa Vilari. May Allah bless this soul like Allama Tabatabai and Shaheed Mutahari and Shaheed Bakr Sadr and Ayatollah Khomeini Rahmatullah. All, may Allah bless their souls. Sayyid Khoi, all of these great personalities who are a guidance for all of us. And you find Sayyid Lari, when I met him, you know, he actually wrote all the books of the principles of Islam, the usul, God and his attributes, resurrection. Brilliant books, masterpieces in my opinion. We should read them if you want to know usul. People ask me, brother, how do I secure my faith? Know usul. Know the principles of life. Know who is God. Know the day of judgment. Know prophets. Know why the system of God works the way it does. And you'll see the derivation of the sharia becomes very easy after that. Ijtihad becomes easier. But I met him and he has written this book. And one of his chapters in this book, by the way, all his books are available online free of charge. If you go to musavilari.org, M-U-S-A-V-I-L-A-R-I.org, you can download all his books in any language you want, in, in PDF, in any format, because he's a blessing to humanity. And he was a wise man, what I call a, a, a sage, an erudite. In his book, he talks about dua. And the power of dua, brilliantly exposed, simple, succinct, but elegantly presented. He said, when you pray, you wonder why dua is accepted or not accepted. He said, Allah accepts all prayers. Now, some argue, well, you know, your heart has to be very pure and has to have very, very, you know, has to be very connected to God in very high stations for your dua to be accepted. I mean, if that's the case, then we're all doomed. <laughs> right? Uh, sure, we should have purity. And the higher we are, the closer we are to God, and shall the more gets accepted. But I don't care if you're the, the dirtiest of the dirtiest creature in the world. God listens to you and he answers you. Even Pharaoh, who spoke to God, God spoke to him. So he was the dirtiest of the dirts. And yet Allah spoke to him. So why should Allah not talk to us? Allah replies everybody. But we ask the question, how is my prayer accepted? There are many ways we can say to God, God, please give me a red Lamborghini. <laughs> you say, Aduni, astajib lakum. I want to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company making a billion dollars a year. And you told me, you ask and I'll give it to you. That's a silly prayer. Material prayer. Now, if a Lamborghini is going to do something good for you and take you into a good trial and tribulation, maybe take you to higher goals and maybe you can do something great, maybe you'll get it. But Allah replies strategically. 
And he says, I love it. I have heard you. I have replied you. But in the scope of time, my reply will come a week later, a month later, a decade later. Do you believe in me? Now we beg from Allah in a very wrong perspective. I've had people come to me and say, Brother, I wasn't praying. My life was great. I started to pray. All hell let loose. I've been praying to God and He's not given me. Like, you know, there was such credit. You know, I had so much credit towards God. Like I did so many favors to God. Now I'm going to go bargain with Him, you know. We're going to go on a, you know, on a bargaining table and we're going to negotiate with God. So God, I'll talk to you. I'll pray to you. But I need A, I need B, I need C. And if you don't give it to me, I may not consider you important, God. I'm being facetious here, but you get my point. Many of us, when we come towards the salah, like we're doing a favor to Allah. Allah says, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّ عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ They think they're doing you a favor by submitting, O oh Prophet. Tell them you have done no favor to God, but rather God has done a favor to you to guide you and to show you this path. So when we come to pray, don't come with any expectations, for He has already given us too much. Shame on us if we don't thank Him. And when we come to salah with khushu, when Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Successful is the believer who comes with khushu. On what grounds is this khushu? My Lord, I have accounted for what you have given me and I can never pay you back. Shame on me for not having come more to you, but I come to submit to you. For you can give me whatever you want and you can take everything you gave me. For you've given me too much. Now pray like that and see the difference in prayer. No bargains. No asking God, I want, I want, you're not giving me, I expect. What expectation? We did nothing to exist. He made us. He shapes us. He grows us. He feeds us. He loves us. Shame on us when we pray. I go to Karbala and I see Imam Hussein alayhi salam. His whole family is being butchered. Butchered. His infant child is being taken. Subhanallah. 14 centuries later, I'm looking at him. I said, how do you have that strength to stand on that battlefield when you have been taken and they're going to chain your family and drag them city to city? And you are the representative of God. I'm not worthy of being their shoes. You get it? Don't come with conditions, please. Imam Hussain looks and says, stop this battle. It's Salah time. The kuffar on the other side said, Salah. Your prayers are not accepted. Imam says, no problem. Say what you want. They say, Abu Thamama reminds Imam Hussain and says, it's prayer time. Imam says, may Allah raise you with a prayer for once the way Ibrahim prayed. Rabbi ja'alni muqeema salati wa min dhurriyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. My Lord, make me prayerful. Rabbi ja'alni muqeema salati wa min dhurriyati. And my children, when Ibrahim and Ismail built the Kaaba, he went down to sujood. He said, Rabbi ja'alni muqeema salati. My Lord, make me prayerful in my generations. For it's gratitude. It's not indoctrination. It's not madness. It's not stupidity. It's love. It's connection. That Imam Hussain alayhi salam stops the battle and says, pray. Pray. You know, he lost half his army during Salah. Half his army received arrows and they died in Salah. Now Imam is teaching me, I'm, there's only 72 warriors, there's a hundred of us that are really defending against 30,000 of these enemies of God. Strategically, we should fight them. And they did. They started at Fajr till Dhar to sustain an army that is much larger than you. Should They should have been annihilated in 30 minutes. It took them half a day. They still couldn't annihilate. And they lost half the army 
in salah what is the imam telling us about the importance of gratitude about dua about be begging and praying and going into sujood it's not an act in futility it's deep it's powerful and we ask the question ya imam your children are being butchered he said as salah as salah we are so grateful to god we make no conditions that while our children are being massacred they say ridam bi qada wa tasliman li amri we are satisfied my lord with what you have decreed and we submit to you this is the dua we should do in in the time of ramadan in the rest of the year pray pray with gratitude look and say my god you've given me too much i can't wait to thank you then when you really really get into that then the night prayer becomes sweet then the extra prayer becomes sweet but the greatest prayer of prayer is in the silence to remember god my time is up but let me conclude in this when we pray let's pray to make allah to to have allah make us like what he wants it's a deep conversation here you find that when you ask allah not for the lamborghinis and the fancy cars ask but that's childish say my lord make me what you want me to be give me wealth if it's good take it from me if it's bad give me long life give me trials if i can handle it don't give it to me if i cannot handle it and if i need to go for greater trials then strengthen my back before you do it now god said look at this creation it's begging me to make them great to elevate them I love them so much that's why I made them and look they are responding to me to be greater So you know as Habakkuk the companions of the cave that's what they did when they were about to be butchered or crucified they didn't know what to do they were stuck in a very difficult situation Allah says am hasabta an ashab al-kahf wal raqim kanu min ayatina ajaba idh awal fityatu ila al-kahf fa qalu rabbana atina min ladunka rahma and Allah replied he said our Lord we don't know what to do we're stuck like when we're sick like anytime pray it's the most powerful thing the zero-sum argument dua salah it never ceases to help even in good times and in bad times Allah said what did I do with the companions of the cave they asked me to make their affairs right they didn't know I was going to put them to sleep for 300 years they didn't know that they were going to sleep for 309 years lunar years they had no idea but i planned it because they asked me to make it right for them so i put them to sleep for 300 years and i woke them up 300 years later like they slept a day and they became they were so young in their age because their fifth generation grandchildren were older than they were and i showed them did you see you asked me to make it good i made it better than you ever imagined this is the kind of dua you and i should do that's why allah says fal yastajibu li wal yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun let them reply me and let them believe in me if they are to be rightly guided may allah give us a tawfiq inshallah to be those servants of god that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with and i advise us all to to read this um, this dua i want us to i will end with this dua please bismillah rahman rahim ilahi bi khass sifatik wa bi izz jalalik wa a'zami asma'ik wa bi asmati anbiya'ik wa bi nuri awliya'ik wa bi dami shuhada'ik wa bi midadi ulama'ik wa bi du'a'i sulaha'ik wa bi munajati fuqara'ik nas'aluka ziyadatan fil 'ilm wa sihhatan fil jism wa tulan fil 'amr fi ta'atik wa sa'atan fil rizq wa tawbatan qabla al maut وراحة عند الموت ومغفرة بعد الموت ونورا في القبر ونجاة من النار ودخولا في الجنة وعافية من كل بلاء الدنيا وعذاب الآخرة بحق محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين O oh Allah in the name of your most gracious attributes the glory of your majesty the greatness of your names the purity of your prophets the light of your near friends the blood of your martyrs the path of your scholars the prayers of your upright servants the sincere prayers of your devoted servants we beg you for more knowledge firmness of body long life to worship you possession of wealth repentance before death tranquility at the time of death salvation after death peace in the grave deliverance from hell entrance into paradise protection from the trials and tribulations of this world and the punishment of the hereafter 
for the sake of Muhammad and his chaste and infallible family. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.